Hi, everyone. Today, I'll start reading a book by Samuel Richardson uh, called The History of Sir Charles Grandison. It's uh, his third novel, um, and all of his novels, number one being Pamela, no, number two being Clarissa, and this third novel, this um, novel is the third one. And all of his novels are epistolary in form, so um, a series of letters. I will start reading the preface today and, and then start reading, and then perhaps read two or three letters per day after that. So yeah, so this, by the way, was published around 1743, I think, if I'm not mistaken. And um, it's quite an old novel. All right, let me share my screen so we can start. Okay, let me see this. All right, The History of Sir Charles Grandison in a Series of Letters by Samuel Richardson, Volume One. Preface, the editor of the following letters takes leave to observe that he has now, in this publication, completed a plan that was the object of his wishes rather than of his hopes to accomplish. The first collection which he published, entitled Pamela, exhibited the beauty and superiority of virtue in an innocent and unpolished mind, with a reward which often, even in this life, a protecting providence bestows on goodness. A young woman of low degree, relating to her honest parents, the severe trials she met with from a master who ought to be, have been her to have been the protector, not the assailer, of her honor, shows the character of a libertine in its truly contemptible light. This libertine, however, from the foundation of good principles laid in his early years by an excellent mother, by his passion for a virtuous young woman, and by her amiable example and unwearied patience when she became his wife, is, after a length of time, perfectly reclaimed. The second collection, published under the title of Clarissa, displayed a more melancholy scene. A young lady of higher fortune and born to happier hopes, a scene involved in such variety of deep distresses as lead her to an untimely death. Affording a warning to parents against forcing the inclinations of their children in the most important article of their lives. And to children, against hoping too far from the fairest assurances of a man void of principle. The heroine, however, as a truly Christian heroine, proves superior to her trials, and her heart, always excellent, refined and exalted by every one of them, rejoices in the approach of a happy eternity. Her cruel destroyer appears wretched and disappointed, even in the boasted success of his vile machinations, but still, Buoyed up with self-conceit and vain presumption, he goes on after every short fit of imperfect, yet terrifying conviction, hardening himself more and more, till, unreclaimed by the most affecting warnings and repeated admonitions, he perishes miserably in the bloom of life and sinks into the grave oppressed with guilt, remorse, and horror. His letters, it is hoped, afford many useful lessons to the gay part of mankind against the, that misuse of wit and youth, of rank and fortune, and of every outward accomplishment, which turns them into a curse to the miserable possessor, as well as to all around him. Here, the editor apprehended, he should be obliged to stop by reason of his precarious state of health in a variety of avocations which claimed his first attention. But it was insisted on by several of his friends, who were well assured he had the materials in his power, that he should produce into public view the character and actions of a man of true honor. He has been enabled to obey these his friends and to complete his first design, and now, therefore, presents to the public in Sir Charles Grandison, the example of a man acting uniformly well through a variety of trying scenes, 
because all his actions are regulated by one steady principle, a man of religion and virtue, of liveliness and spirit, accomplished and agreeable, happy in himself, and a blessing to others. From what has been premised, it may be supposed, that the present collection is not published ultimately, nor even principally, any more than the other two, for the sake of entertainment only. A much nobler end is in view. Yet it is hoped the variety of characters and conversations necessarily introduced into so large a correspondence as these volumes contain will enliven as well as instruct. The rather as the principal correspondents are young ladies of polite education and of lively spirits. The nature of familiar letters written, as it were, to the moment, while the heart is agitated by hopes and fears on events undecided, must plead an excuse for the bulk of a collection of this kind. Mere facts and characters might be comp comprised in a much smaller compass, but would they be equally interesting? It happens, fortunately, that an account of the juvenile years of the principal person is narratively given in some of the letters. As many, however, as could be spared, have been omitted. This is not one episode in the whole, I'm sorry, there is not one episode in the whole, nor after Sir Charles Grandison is introduced, one letter inserted, but what tends to illuminate the principal design. Those which precede his introduction will not, it is hoped, be judged unnecessary on the whole, as they tend to make the reader acquainted with persons, the history of most of whom is closely interwoven with that of Sir Charles. Sonnet, sweet moralist, whose generous labors tend with ceaseless diligence to guide the mind in the wild maze of error wandering blind to virtue, truth, and honor, glorious end of glorious toils, vainly would I commend, in numbers worthy of your sense refined, this last and great work, which leaves all praise behind and justly styles you of mankind the friend. Pleasure would profit artful while you blend, and now the fancy, now the judgment feed, with grateful change, with every passion sways, numbers would never to graver lore attend. Caught by the charm, grow virtuous as they read, and lives reformed shall give you genuine praise. <laughs>